Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. Now, there is no doubt about it, this country's favourite pastime is what they call the beautiful game. That is, of course, soccer. But all is not well in German football, so we've invited along a man, and here he is, Gerd Dembowski, who's an expert not just on the game as it's played on the field, but also on one very important but sometimes neglected aspect of what football is all about, that is, the fans. Gerd, first of all, welcome to Talking Germany. It's great to have you here. Yeah? Thanks for having me here. Yeah. Cool. Nice now, I'd, I'd like to begin on an upbeat note. I'd like to begin by asking you, what is, what is good about German soccer at the moment? As I'm not a specialist about the game, mm -hmm. I have to say what's good about German soccer is that football fans are articulating themselves. They are organizing, they are trying to produce dialogue, and they are trying to... Uh, stay in the game, trying to keep the game as a, as a game for young people who don't want to pay so much, who can't pay so much, and who try to use football in a way to escape from the daily life. Mm -hmm. And I think this is very important in society. Mm -hmm. And if you take these places away from people, um, it might escalate on another level. That's really fascinating. I thought you were going to say at the beginning of the show, well, the national team are really good at the moment. They're among the best in the world and the German stadiums are really good stadiums, what have you. And you started right at the bottom. Yeah. What's good about German soccer is the German soccer fans. But the German soccer fans are not happy about German soccer. There are problems. Well, I mean, there's, many, there's much success they had in the last, like, 10, 20 years. They they have the standing terraces, right? And mm -hmm. uh, they have safe standing. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a thing they can be really proud of. Um, so if you look on the international level, they are, let's say, they are moaning on a, on a high level, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, but you can always keep only a high level if you try to, to moan, and if you try to get back to it, if you try to find arguments and, and, and not only shout in the stadiums. And mm -hmm. I think that's why they are not happy with the situation. And if you see that they want to uh, control people naked before they go to the stadium, I think that's really alarming in a way. There's a lot of stuff we've got to talk about here. Uh, I'd like to, to, but let's just talk about you for, first of all, though, because it's interesting. You, you really are talking about soccer through the, through the perspective, through the lens of the soccer fans, yeah, who are often very neglected in perceptions of soccer. You in Germany are called a fan researcher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is a fan researcher? If you research fans, you cannot do it from the university. You have to leave it. You have to go outside. Mm -hmm. So I started in the early 90s and I, to know what hooligans are, I went there. I ran with them. I was there at you the ran with when them. it happened. Yes, yeah? sure, yeah. And uh, it's kind of like cultural studies. You go to youth cultures. You try to find out about them and... Uh, this kind of uh, gave me a lot of street credibility in one hand, but on the other hand, uh, I also had very precise uh, um, reports about it, books about it. So I'm kind of uh, like a scientist between the two worlds, if you want, because I'm sometimes very social anthropologically. Mm -hmm. uh, I go into the stadiums and, and try to become a football fan in a way. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting stuff. First impressions there of the fan researcher Gerd Dembowski. Here is more. Standing on the sidelines between the stanchion and the corner flag, among fans and functionaries, Gerd Dembowski knows his way around a football pitch. He grew up in the industrial Ruhr region, the son of East Prussian Polish immigrants. Dembowski's preferences in life became very clear early on. Football and music. He wanted to become a professional player, but a severe shoulder injury destroyed that dream. Instead, Dembowski began working as a fan, starting with his home club, Duisburg. By 1996, he had taken on duties as a spokesman for the BAFF, the Germany-wide association of active football fans. Not long after, he became one of the founders of the international network Football Against Racism in Europe. Every violent act in football is one too many. Every injury is one too many. 
While getting his degree in the social sciences, Dembovsky began to write and lecture on such widely diverse topics as sociology and philosophy, fan and pop culture, Foucault and football. His books have been translated into numerous languages, including Chinese. But there was always time for music. Dembovsky appears with country and folk bands. I'd rather die young than grow old without you. So don't ever leave me, whatever you do. But his greatest success so far is a traveling exhibition, Tatort Stadion, Target Stadium, which addresses the subject of racism and discrimination in football. Over the past 10 years, it's been shown more than 200 times and is still touring successfully. In the heated discussion of violence perpetrated by fans in German stadiums, Dembovsky's experience means he's currently in demand as an intermediary, most recently as a fan researcher at the University of Hanover. And today, he's our guest on Talking Germany, Gerd Dembovsky. Gerd, you come from... Uh a, a working class, a really traditional working class region of Germany, the Ruhr Valley, the industrial Ruhr Valley. You come from a, a working class family. I'd like to now begin by asking you, sort of, to what extent soccer is a working class sport? Uh, it wasn't in the beginning because uh, the roots were quite bourgeois mm -hmm. because you needed time to play soccer. You couldn't work. Yeah. Um, it opened later, and I think it's also when football fans are against commercial things all the time. They have to remember that uh, commercialization, professionalization, opened the gates for working class. Uh, the event invention of, uh, of leisure time mm -hmm. opened mm -hmm. uh, the gates for, this, for the working class. So this is really important. Then it turned to become a game for the working class because the working class needed it the most to maybe uh, get distracted from a work they see. And, and, and after 20 years, they re re realize we still have to do it for another 20 years. So, um, and maybe we don't like it anymore, but we can't change. You're talking but, about their jobs. People were doing jobs that were drudgery and they needed, a, they needed something at the weekend to give right. them an alternative, to and give they them some inspiration. And they couldn't change their jobs, but yeah. football gives you the impression that everything can happen. That's the football that I grew up with. I can remember football being like that. And is football still like that? There's an awful lot of money in the game these days. Is that good or bad? In Germany, we try to, to build this bridge and we try to keep this bridge alive. And I think uh, about our ideas of fan organizations being very much involved and also having uh, fan social workers, street workers in football. Uh, we are very much attached uh, the Germans would not say so, but looking on an international level, we should say so, I think. Mm. And I think that tries to keep it alive. And mm. the, the thing is that stadiums now change their names. Uh, shirt colors change all the time. Depends Players, on the sponsors, doesn't it? Yeah. Coaches change all the time anyway. Mm. So what is the idea of identification these days? It's not so easy. So what football fans decided to, uh, to rescue themselves is they said, um, we are the tradition. We are here all the time. Our oral spoken history. Okay, and that's well, what while they, we're talking about this, what but one very important thing is we've mentioned it, money. Not just money that's coming into the clubs because through investors, but the fans actually have to pay to get into the ground. Right. What about prices for actually getting into the ground in Germany? It's often said that, it's a, you know, that, that the tickets here are much less expensive than elsewhere. Is that actually true? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's really important. And I think... Uh, the German FA is, or even the, the German League, Premier League is very interested to keep it that way because they understand that the young guys, the people who cannot pay so much, are multiplicators for the game. Mm. They are going to every game. They are building the, the, the big mass behind the club, who is actually the club in days where a club has not so many means of identification. So what you're talking about is ownership, and that there are different kinds of ownership. There are people who are putting money into the club, and there are people who actually sort of are putting their soul into the club. Yeah, and that's what the, what the club 
can promote. Mm -hmm. And the club does promote it and they should also um, create a dialogue in that way. They should realize that they should treat them as sponsors because they're really important to, to give the game a kind of like a trademark brand. Yeah. You, you, when you were talking about you were talking about fans and you said guys, a, 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 a stadiums, a German soccer stadiums, is it a man's world? That is traditionally what we saw, but I'm not. Is it changing? Right, it has changed. Uh, like in the whole, like if you say there are stadiums with like twenty percent, but if you if you see it in general, you would say uh, seven men, three women. Mm -hmm. like this is the dimension. But uh, when you look back to the ultras movement, who is the movement in f German football fan culture who decides uh, the, the atmosphere? In a what, way. Is, what is an ultra? Um, Much talked about, but I'm not sure that I really know what an ultra is. It's a fan culture that is very much influenced by youth culture. Uh, in their center is uh, the atmosphere, changing the atmosphere, providing a good atmosphere and uh, as a youth culture in a globalized world, they realize to patchwork from other youth cultures. Mm. And you can find people who are more like hip hop dressed in a way. Some people are more referring to punk. They're also coming from different areas in the town and the club is the roof that keeps them together. So they are patchworking, they can change faces, they can change their masks. And that's what they do. So if you say hooligans were people in their center was violence, that's what they were looking for. Violence and ultra movements is a reactive violence. They're not looking for violence. It happened to them later. Mm -hmm. And that, is, uh, that makes a big difference because they do a lot of social work. They collect a lot of money for a charity. Mm -hmm. uh, they have uh, charity uh, associations build up and they do, yeah, they do social work in their, in their uh, quarters. Mm. You're talking again about, about soccer very much from the fans' perspective, and that's obviously your perspective as well. But tell me about the clubs, the, the, the Bundesliga clubs. Who do they want to have coming into their stadiums? Do they want to have sort of, you know, fans like me, middle class people with their kids or whatever? Or do they want to have the ultras coming in? Or do they want to mix? What are they after? I think they want a good mix. They understand that every area in the stadium is important. Every kind of person is important. And uh, if you see the president of the German Premier League, uh, he he's clearly says we will never give up on standing terraces. We know that this is our, our bench that we can build on. This is our fundament. And that's where the people that will sit maybe in the next 10 years or something. It's a, it's a different concept maybe than in some other mm. uh, countries, I think. And this, this is very important because that's certainly the main thing you've, you, you've been talking about is the difference between Germany and other footballing countries, places where football is played a lot. You're talking about the standing room in stadiums. Does, do all the Bundesliga clubs have standing areas these days? Yes, sure. Yeah. 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 And that's certainly a big difference to, for example, the UK, where there were quite often the atmosphere in the same. You're smiling. You know what I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there was a different approach in the UK. In general, you have to say that uh, stadiums were older than German stadiums in general. Germany had more, to, uh, more international um, tournaments that brought money into the country to change stadium to modern standards uh, from, from step by step. And uh, in England, then we had the catastrophes, right? I mean, the first one wasn't in England, uh, the one in Heisel in yeah. 1985, where 39 people died. And uh, then uh, uh, Sheffield, Hillsborough. Mm. But then we found out that it's uh, massively also uh, a mistake by the police, even in Heisel, even in Heisel. And also the, uh, the, the, the old stadium in Heisel. It was clear that something could happen there. And so um, in England, they kind of outpriced people mm. in a way. And uh, they didn't do social work, but they do they did much more surveillance and... And, and I have to tell you that I know in the UK now, people are looking to Germany and saying, maybe that's the way we need to go. But there are problems in Germany. Violence and hooliganism uh, are both, it seems, on the rise in German soccer grounds. It's a development that has led the soccer authorities here in Germany to come up with a package of security measures designed to ensure that fans will enjoy what is being termed a safe stadium experience. Let's take a closer look. Spectacular images of fans storming the pitch and throwing fireworks from the terraces. Scenes like these have heated up debate in recent months on safety in German stadiums and prompted politicians to demand more stringent security measures. 
But many fans think that puts footballing culture at risk. Fans are fans, and they need their traditions, apart from violence, which I think is awful. But fans should be allowed to let off steam. It's clear that stadiums have to be made safer. I'm all for that, because when I take my children to a football match, I don't want to be frightened for them. The 36 clubs in the first and second divisions of the Bundesliga have approved the security concept by a wide margin. The concept includes more rigorous supervision of spectators, stricter entry checks, and more severe punishments for clubs and fans involved in violence. We haven't done this today for political reasons. We haven't done this for state interior ministers or the police. The members of the league associations, the clubs and corporations are doing it from a sense of their own responsibility. Of all the clubs, only St. Pauli and Union Berlin have rejected the concept. Fans weren't involved in drafting the concept, and they weren't included in the discussions. It was drafted by people who haven't a clue, and that's the wrong way to go about it. In the stadium, minutes of silent protest from the fans. Their campaign, no agreement without a vote, seems to have borne fruit. The German Football League is now offering new talks. Okay, Gerd Dombrowski, what is good and what is bad about these proposals from your perspective? I think good is that the German FA and the German League understood that a dialogue is not nothing only for the press. It should be open for the solutions. And I think that's what they realized mm. after the big protests. Um, the other, thing, the other thing is that I've seen many uh, security papers in the last 20 years, and most of them are kind of disappearing later on if the wave, uh, if the moral panic in the media is gone, if the moral panic does not influence well, is, these is, uh, that, That's then the important so question. Is this a moral pan panic? Is this something that is media driven or is there really a problem uh, the, the, that has increased in the last year or two in German soccer around violence? Right. I wouldn't blame the media. The media is a, is a transporter of it, but of course the institutions uh, realize it. They bring it to the media. It's the politics who have so many topics in security every day and not so maybe much the knowledge about football. Uh, and then everything is working together and the media, of course, play, a, play an important role in it. Uh, but we do, I mean, we do know just some of the figures. We know that, for example, I mean, here's a figure that I've, that I've got. Uh, in in the 2011-2012 season, there was the highest number of criminal proceedings in 12 years. That appears to indicate there's a serious problem or not. Yeah, but but you see, if you see the numbers these days, it's nearly zero. So it, it went from zero to 0 0.0006. I'm so with you. what are mm -hmm. we talking about? I mean, every person who gets injured is one person too many. Every person who who shows violence sh should be, uh, 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 yeah, not banned, but maybe also social work or whatever is good for them. Um, but if you would see the German Oktoberfest in Munich, mm -hmm. like one day of the German Oktoberfest, Big beer festival, yeah. same violence as in one whole season mm -hmm. in the first two German leagues. Mm -hmm. And if you compare, for example, violence in pubs, in uh, discos, in whatever, uh, if you see the German uh, um, shooting clubs, you know, yeah, right. Uh, okay, so you're saying soccer fans. Not yeah, in the media. You're saying soccer fans are being demonised in a in a, in, a, in a way, yeah. But you, wh why is there violence in football stadiums in the first place? What's the, what's all that about? Mm, I think this is difficult, of course, because of course there can there can be like psychologically, like personal psychologically, uh, so an idea stuff. of, of yeah, mm. expressing too much in a way that you're not really happy with how your life went. Of course, that's clear. Some people collect stamps and it's fine for them. Some maybe get violent and go Yeah, but I mean, football. we saw, for example, but here in Berlin at the Hertha Club, when they, uh, at the end of the season, when they were relegated, there was a pitch invasion. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of aggression. There was a lot of nastiness. Yeah. That was a major event. Uh, there are things like this happening, but this example is a very bad one because oh. pitch invasions after someone got relegated mm -hmm. or uh, went up promoted, um, you have are a very high typical level of tolerance and for... <laughs> no person on this day was injured. Yeah. 
all people, if you see them, they run happily on the pitch because their team promoted, Dusseldorf promoted for the first league after more than 15 years. Mm -hmm. nothing, nothing happened there. Mm -hmm. And everyone was talking about this and people uh, mix up violence and pyrotechnics. That's, I think, the problem because... Is that a problem, the pyrotechnics, the fireworks, the flares? That's certainly something that has increased in recent years, I feel. I mean, I go to soccer grounds quite often and I see this happening. Now. Right. Yeah. I mean, the problem is that they are illegal and so uh, they shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And I think fan culture cannot step back and say, OK, we do that. So, uh, but the authorities, which is the club in a way, and, but also uh, the stewards and maybe the police outside the stadiums, they are in charge of uh, taking care of the game and not letting people in with these things. So... Um, I think that pyrotechnics has nothing to do with violence because no one brings pyrotechnics in to hurt someone. Mm -hmm. If you, even violence in a stadium doesn't happen. Surveillance, no way. If violence happens, it happens somewhere before you reach the stadium or after you left. So uh, pyrotechnics has something to do with a symbol for uh, a certain kind of atmosphere. It became too much of a symbol, I think, because even if people would reach to be uh, uh, allowed to take pyrotechnics, nothing of their other problems would change. Mm -hmm. Like, n none of them. Mm -hmm. Like, if you see, uh, always the fear of losing the standing terrace is a very important problem. Another big topic uh, in fan cultures is trying to keep the Saturday at 15.30, or like... Three, the traditional three time when a German PM. game starts, yeah. As a traditional centra, central time. Mm -hmm. This is another way uh, they are fighting in... Um, so um, I think the, the symbol is too big from all sides, from the fans, from the media, if, especially if you look at the people who got injured. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying, yes, there is a problem, there is an element of violence, but it's very small. The press and the authorities have tended to overreact. Definitely, if you see it in relation to other um, violent topics in okay. the society. Okay, okay. Nevertheless, if hooliganism is one of the problems at German football grounds here in Germany, then another problem is racism. Let's now visit a project in uh, the eastern German state of Brandenburg that's trying to tackle the problem of racism in sport in general. Right-wing extremism in sport has many faces. At times there's open acknowledgement that it exists, but a lot takes place behind the scenes and can remain undiscovered for a long time. The Sport Association of the city of Cottbus has reacted and invited its coaches to a discussion. Around 30 participants from football, basketball and the martial arts are asking themselves what each club can do about neo-Nazis in its own ranks. For me it's about problem solving, what we can do as a club, what rights we have, whether we've acted properly and also the symbols by which you can recognize these people. You have to listen to the boys and girls you're coaching, on trips away, to what they say and the music they're listening to and call it into question. If parents say, I won't let my son box against a Turk, then you have to deal with that. Activity instead of passivity. Keeping silent is often the most dangerous option. Especially in amateur sports, clubs often don't know what to do. The most common assertions I've heard during my activities are, we don't have that problem and that doesn't concern us. But the fact that incidents occur time and again proves just the opposite. Clubs across Germany are affected. We're all aware that this can happen in our clubs and local organizations. We won't shy away from the problem. The clubs know this and increasingly they're confronting it. The organizers hope the participants communicate what they've learned here to their clubs so that every member understands the importance of fair play and tolerance in sports. We've talked about the problem of, of, of violence, hooliganism, yeah? which you have tended to play down a wee little bit, yeah? What about the problem of racism? How real is it in German soccer? Mm -hmm. If I look at racism, I want to look at discrimination in general. Also, if you see homophobia, for example, sexism, uh, forms of people with a, um, with a handicap, for example. And uh, I think 
a lot of people are looking at these 50 up to 80 neo-Nazis that maybe every big team has somewhere in the stadium because it's in a way a mirror of society. Mm. Like the, the, the courts are looking at it, the police is looking at it, uh, social workers are looking at it, anti-fascist action is looking at it. Many people are dealing with this 50 to 80 people. What I'm much more interested in is the big mass who is always creating these 50 or 80 people. Mm -hmm. They are not Nazis, they are not racist, they wouldn't describe themselves as such. But there is a big thing of, which I would call with Robert Connell a hegemonial masculinity, an old school masculinity that um, tries to always reproduce a certain way of what is a man, what is uh, social Darwinism, what is authoritarianism, uh, what is um, yeah, supremacy in a way. It's very important. We and the others, as Norbert Elias said. Mm -hmm. We and the others. This is aggressive. You're talking from a very spoken, academic uh, perspective there. I mean, you've, you've actually been among, among football, soccer fans who are racist soccer fans. Yeah. yeah. What do they say? Um, the change of face... I mean, you can't uh, quote sociology to them. You actually have to sort of talk to them. The face of, of racism in, in soccer has changed in Germany. Um, they don't go to the stadium and, and show the Hitler salute or something like that. It's, it wouldn't be easy to do so. Mm. They changed their face. They, they went more into pop culture. And one of them said to me in an interview, uh, when I go to a stadium at the beginning, I look where it's like the first, the first way of discrimination where everyone agrees. And uh -huh. you find that everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you, For example, have you got an example of what for, that could be? It's always we and the others. For example, one is like you're coming from a village in North England mm -hmm. and not from London, for example. Okay. This is where it starts and that's where they start. That's where they join in. That's what football offers to them. That's, that's the danger. They kind of find their seat, their symbolical seat there. Mm -hmm. And how can you... How can you what, I mean, we, we saw that report about people who are actually trying to tackle the problem in, in, in soccer and other sports, yeah. What's the best way to, uh, to, uh, to approach the problem? I mean, first of all, in Germany, we try to reach young kids before they become really organised football fans and try to explain them the right-wing symbols because they change all the time and they are very clever in using popular culture in trademarks and stuff. That's what we do. That's what our exhibition does. Mm -hmm. What we also do is in Germany is a lot of social workers are working in fan projects. They are not only working with neo-Nazis. Some do. Some try to, to uh, get them out of there or get, not, don't, don't let new people get into it. But they also try to find creative people amongst these 50,000 in the arena. They try to find them and bring them together to, to change the atmosphere, to create a new atmosphere, an atmosphere where people... And does, and does, that, does that work? Are there, are there grounds, are there clubs in Germany where that's yeah. having an effect that you, they, you can be seen, can be felt, can be heard? Definitely. I think uh, also that we have a big culture of dialogue in Germany amongst football fans and also recognised by the authorities uh, is, is, an, is an example how it works. Mm -hmm. That only does work because people are doing this, mm -hmm. because people are trying to bring out the good of football mm -hmm. and trying to uh, make it another place. When I came into football first in the 80s, it was a game, a hard working class, tough game. It was very racist and I wasn't very comfortable, but I came from a working class background, so I behaved like they behaved. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. You mm -hmm. see, like, the, the older guys, they are cool, you behave like them. But if you come to a football game in Germany today, you found a different, uh, uh, a different active culture. It's differently, you have to read a lot of internet homepages, you have to um, take care of your style in a way, you have to be aware of fan politics, the things I talked about before. So there is a different culture of, of discourse, if you mm -hmm. want. Well, it's interesting to hear all this because certainly the commercialisation of soccer that we've been talking about hasn't changed the face of, the, of, of, of how soccer fans, you know, are, are seen and are presenting themselves on the, on the terraces. That's really uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, t tell me a little bit about your, your exhibition. Uh, I think it was actually two exhibitions, two separate exhibitions that went on around Germany. Uh, what, what were you actually, what were the exhibits? What were you showing? We were showing right-wing symbols. We, we had scarves that were handed out in stadiums. We kind of found them, we how, bought how them. You, you bought them? <laughs> yeah, we bought them or we asked, uh, yeah. we asked stewards who maybe uh, yeah. 
but confiscate rid of them. them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And mm. uh, I think hey, that's what we did. We also tried for the f for the first time to build a historical um, background of how people try to recruit uh, uh, football fans for the neo-Nazi movement. Um, that's what we try to f to to prove yeah. because the German FA and others said that's not happening. Even homophobia, we first we were the first in the world to tackle homophobia because we had a seven-point plan against homophobia in 2002, and that was the first ever. And uh, they said, no, there is no homophobia. And we suddenly had pictures mm -hmm. because we were amongst them. Mm -hmm. Mesut Ozil, Sami Khedira, Mario Gomez. I'm just naming three names of people that they're, they're, they're not exactly necessarily typical German names. You know, these are these are big stars in the German national team, and there are many more. Yeah, who have got sort of immigrant backgrounds. The, the whole, the, the 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 way German soccer presents itself through the national team has changed in recent years. How important has that been? I think it's very important, not only for the face of Germany in when you look at other countries, but also uh, there are role models, of course. I mean, if we look to German amateur football, it will take more time for an amateur player that Mesut Özil makes use to him. It's not really the point, but mm. as a player, they get encouraged that they can make it. Yeah. They can make it up there and that wasn't possible before. I mean, there was a history of a hundred migrants or so before the picture of Mesut Özil, Kadira, Azamoa and others was drawn. Mm. But the German football was one about, we learn it because we want to win. Mm. And that's how we behave. Um, I think the idea around it has changed. Just to prove that we're not soccer obsessives, let's have a quick look at another aspect of Gert's life, because he has interestingly been a vegan for a decade or so. Now, one of many, it seems, here in Germany these days. Lunchtime in Germany. Many restaurant menus now feature not only vegetarian dishes, but also vegan meals. There are now about 40 vegan restaurants in the country. One of them is Kops in Berlin's Mitte district. Chef Björn Moschinski has been a vegan for over 15 years and wants his dishes to appeal to a broad public. He came up with a simple concept, good solid German food, all made entirely without animal products. I want to reach people who say, a vegan diet isn't for me, or I don't know what vegans eat, or I don't like that anyway. Today, he's certainly shown how good vegan food can taste. Very well seasoned and very tasty. I like the food. I would eat it again. At some point, I'll feel like having a schnitzel, but this was actually pretty good. In Berlin, many vegans shop here, at Europe's first fully vegan supermarket. Everything here is entirely vegan, from cosmetics to ready-made meals, baked goods made on site, and even cold cuts and cheese made from soybeans. Jan Breda came up with the idea. When our customers walk in the door, we want them to know that everything they buy here, everything in the store, is made entirely without animal products or ingredients. Germany is currently home to about 600,000 vegans, eight times as many as just three years ago. Berlin-based nutritionist Karin Franz says the image of veganism has changed fundamentally. Vegan food is no longer just a niche product. It used to be that when people heard the word vegan, they imagined sandals and a long beard. But now it's hip, and the products appeal to a younger clientele. But food isn't all that can be vegan. The Berlin label Umasan makes fashions solely from plants. Designer twins Anja and Sandra Uman use no wool, fur, or genuine silk. Instead, the fabrics are made from recycled polyesters, hemp, bamboo fibers, and soy silk. Veganism today doesn't mean a Spartan existence. In German cities, at least, a vegan lifestyle is both easy and enjoyable. And what you can now see is a pair of vegan shoes. That's right, Gert? That's right, yeah, totally right. Can you explain? It's made of plants and 
as they said, second-hand used uh, synthetic. Yeah. And does that apply to the, uh, the rest of your, the, the gear that you're wearing as well? Yeah, oh. sure, sure. It's not only... A complete vegan outfit. It's not only the diet, it's, it's the mm. outfit in general. And it's also um, a critical approach of, of maybe having animals at home or not, yeah. having pets. Yeah, okay. Tell me what I... I mean, I'm not a vegan. Yeah. Tell me what I'm missing. <laughs> You're missing very tasty food. That's what, that was the first thing why I did it. You're obviously thinking back to some very specific experience. Uh, yeah. yeah, because I changed the traditional idea of food in a complete way. And I became a very good cook because I became vegan. Uh, because I had to do more. That's what a lot of people more. say. That's what a lot of people say. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that, I mean, I was at a certain point of, of my life and wanted to change. And, and mm -hmm. I felt better when I woke up in the morning. I felt more active. You know? mm -hmm. And maybe that also what provides maybe burnout with me, I think. Burnout. Yeah, I'm there. I'm in the field for 20 years. Yeah. So um, veganism kind of was a refresher mm -hmm. for the rest of my life. Okay, okay. And in, in that report, there was a figure which I have actually seen uh, elsewhere: 600,000 vegans in Germany. You, you're nodding. You find that very plausible and realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, if you see how vegan restaurants grew in the last few years in, in, in German bigger cities, if you want, uh, we can see that. I can see that because it's easier for me to find food. Mm. Uh, I can totally say it, how I ran <laughs> to find uh, some oat milk like 10 or 12 years ago and how it is now. Uh. So it has definitely changed. And of course, America and England uh, were big role models for this. I was going to say, because I mean, I am British originally, and wh wh when I'm in the UK and I invite people around for dinner, if six or seven people are coming around for dinner, I would always say to them, do you have any specific sort of eating habits that I ought to sort of be careful about, yeah? The same thing would happen in the US. That doesn't happen in Germany. If, if, if you invite people around for dinner, boop, meat on the table. That's true. And it's yeah. also about, it's the idea of meat as being a sign of power in a symbolical way, but... Um, that's why I always say by myself before I'm invited, but I'm a vegan, but please mm -hmm. don't stress mm -hmm. in a way. We find a way or I bring stuff, I don't care. Yeah. I'm used to this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, one other aspect of, uh, of, your, of what you're up to is not just soccer, mm -hmm. not just that you're a vegan, you're also a big country music uh, practitioner <laughs> and fan. You've actually written a book called Football Versus Country Music, yeah? In the German, Fußball Versus uh, Country Music, yeah? yeah? What's all that about? When you go to, to work in, in football fan cultures, yeah. you cannot be a fan at some point anymore because you, cannot have, you don't have time to look at the pitch. You look at the people, at the phenomenons. And uh, then you, use the passion, uh, you lose the passion. Mm -hmm. um, you have lost your passion for soccer? Uh, <laughs> not really. I discovered it again when I lived in Brighton in England, in South England, mm -hmm. um, in a point when I realized this is not the country I live in, I don't have to look at the phenomenon. I don't have to look at racism, I can start looking at the pitch again. And no one is recognizing me, because when I started to be longer in the topic, uh, people came in, in the stadium and wanted to talk to me. They know who you are. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And in England, I, I could start again and, and see that the idea, that the passion, like an archive of the passion is still in me. Mm -hmm. But if you work in soccer, like 20 hours per day sometimes, you, want, you don't want to have like uh, four hours of soccer again to, to finish the day. And then that's where uh, country music and folk music came in and traveling to the United States where- Yeah, you, um, took, you took this book to the United, you went on tour yeah, of the yeah, US. Yeah, yeah, I, there's no book translation in English, yeah. but uh, I made little, pitching, little yeah. fanzines, mm -hmm. little copied uh, magazines that I um, brought there. And I had like 27 appearances. And I also talked about homophobia in, in football and soccer. Yeah. And that was interesting because yeah. the audience was completely different. There were 80% women uh -huh. in the audience and in Germany it was the other way around. Well, that reflects the way soccer gets played in the US as well. A lot of women and a lot of young girls play soccer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's not this, this male working class background behind soccer. And that's where I learned that this male background is a social construction. Because in America, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. Soccer is something for people who are softer, who are middle class, yeah. Who, yeah. and especially for women as well. Yeah. Do you play yourself these days at all? I try as as a lot uh, as most uh, I mean as often as possible. But mm -hmm. uh, I had an important uh, or a very bad shoulder in, in like injury, and, and mm -hmm. when I play, I often do like this, like yeah, Franz Beckenbauer did in a very important <laughs> game, because I, I I fear it. Yeah. yeah. 
And as a fan, are you going to reveal to us uh, who your team are? I started in Duisburg, mm -hmm. in the area where I come mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... A real working class club, if there ever was one. Yeah, Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then I lost track in a way because that was the point that I was talking about before. But then I came to Brighton mm -hmm. and I had a season ticket for two years. But I'm going there since 1996, ongoing, as yeah. often as possible. And uh, there is a fan movement that tried to change a lot. And I was part of this in a way. Wow. Brighton are your club. Let's move on to the Talking Germany quiz at the end of the show. So I've got a couple of uh, very quick questions for you. Do you prefer playing or watching soccer? <laughs> <laughs> I would prefer playing, actually, yeah, yeah, but I don't have the time to do so. Oh dear, no good. When you go to a match, would you rather sit or stand? Stand. No doubt about it. Um, in 10 years' time, will there be more or less violence in German soccer? The same. Will it still be a working-class game? We are fighting for it. Okay, dokie. Okay. I hope you win. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's our lot with the uh, soccer expert, the fan researcher and country music aficionado, Gerd Dembowski. Uh, great guest. If you want to find out more, read my blog on the Talking Germany website. And if you've enjoyed the show as much as I have, then do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs>